Coming up on this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society, we beat all the levels in Super Mario Maker, except the ones that can't be beaten. It's dangerous to go alone, so the Nintendo Cartridge Society goes with ya. Welcome to Nintendo Cartridge Society. My name is Patrick Ellers, and I am joined, as I'm always joined, by my co-host, Mark Mitchell. We've got a good show for you today. We're going to be talking about the news from the week, including an F-099 update. And then on Thursday, we are ranking the transformations in Princess Peach colon Showtime exclamation point. But Mark, in the meantime, how's it going? It's going great. Uh, for us, it has, <laughs> it has only been a week yes. since uh, we've recorded a news episode. But yes. for listeners, it's been two weeks away. As we record this episode, yes. it is April 1st, April Fool's Day. And I feel like we were April Fooled last week, and it's uh, like coming home to roost on us now because we recorded a news episode that we had to scrap because my voice sounded crazy. We went through the, we went through the whole thing. Yeah. Like, we, we recorded a news episode. Yep. Turns out... Weren't able to post it because we're of not able to reasons. post it. That's right. But it still felt nice to go through the ritual of a recording on <laughs> right, Monday night right, and right. talking about Nintendo. Hey, do we like doing a show or do we just like talking to each other? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but so today we're going to we're going to pick up some of those same little news bits mm-hmm. uh, as we did last week, which only you and I will know. So I don't know why we're. <laughs> Exposing, we're Recap, like we're like yes. we're like magic. We're like magic revealing ourselves. We we're like are the masked magician. We are the masked yes. podcasters mm-hmm. being unmasked, right? And then we're going to be blackballed from the podcasting community <laughs> for giving away all of our secrets. Uh, Mark, before we give away all of our secrets, uh, your vacuum cleaner. Do you like your vacuum cleaner? I like. I have two. Okay. Um, and I like both of them. Fine. <laughs> Okay, what are they? Can I do you mind yeah, me asking? Yeah, so I uh, well, I'm sure as you've noticed on Amazon, like product brands are just a random assortment of letters, yes, or words that don't make sense together, crammed together, yes, with no space in between them, right? And so I think my that va- the like handheld vacuum cleaner mm-hmm. that is similar to a Dyson but is not a Dyson yes. is from Tineco, okay. Tineco, T I N E C O, sure. Very, got it on um, Prime Day. I, I hesitated because it's like, how much of an advertisement for Amazon should this You be? already said Amazon. Yeah. Though, so like, it's too uh, late. Yeah. So I got a couple of years ago, totally fine with it. Yeah. Comes with a bunch of uh, accessories. And then the other one I have is like from another company th- whose name I can't remember, but it's basically a Roomba. <laughs> okay. All right. And it, so, but it, and it does, it's like autonomous. Uh, yeah. It does like a little patrol. Mm-hmm. Um. Because we have a, uh, like a standing Dirt Devil, right? Like it is the Dirt Devil brand, um, which I always associate with like the sort of handheld, like little vacuum, mm-hmm. right? Like a Dustbuster mm-hmm. style. Um, but this is not that. It like stands upright and I, have, I can feel it dying on me. Does it have, a, is it, does it have like the bag? Does no it bag. bag? Okay. It, it's got like the canister in front that is like clear and you can see it like sucking up the oh, dirt. Fun. Um, Oh, kind of fun, yeah. Uh, I, but I always feel like it's it's lacking in the suction department. Oh, sure. Um, and so, like, I'll vacuum, and then I'm like, there's still, like, I can see there's still stuff in the on the floor here. Well, I like the Tyneco. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> you think? Yeah. Yeah. But honestly, I covet mm. a Dyson. A true Dyson. I, I do. Because of the, the suction. Yeah. Right. So here, here's the thing. I want to get a new vacuum cleaner, but I kind of don't want to go through like the rig- rigmarole of buying the perfect vacuum. I kind of want to just like roll the dice, spend a little bit of money, but not do a ton of research. Let me, I will send you yeah. what I purchased because right. other members of my family also purchased it okay, by they, accident. We right. all just happened to buy the same vacuum cleaner. Sure. You all subscribe to Amazon Prime, <laughs> right. a product you love. <laughs> And recommend to your friends and family. <laughs> um, and we, yeah, we all just like 
three of us just happened to buy the same vacuum cleaner, and we all like it fine. So let me send that to you. Right. Yes, um, thank you. But also, this feels like a great opportunity for listeners. Right, to, to go uh, to our Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to say suggest, <laughs> suggest the vacuum cleaners that they're just fine with. They can do two things. As well. Um, uh, yes, suggest, if you have a vacuum cleaner that you like, uh, uh, let me know. Um, uh, Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com, gmail.com. Uh, which you can also use to get into our Reddit. Reddit? Discord. You can use it to get into our Discord. We are not on Reddit. Um, uh, and you can uh, tell, tell me that there, too. Um, we're, we're all out of order now. Patreon. Patreon.com slash Nintendo Cartridge Society. Um, if you would like to uh, support us over there, we are, uh, the, if you are supporting us at the 8-bit or 16-bit levels, you get access to our once-a-month episodes of miniseries that we are going through. We are currently making our way through NCS Arcade. Yeah, we just released an episode on Kirby Tilt and Tumble yep. that was originally released for the Game Boy Color, believe it or not, in the year 2000. And the year 2001. The Game Boy Color is still kicking around. Uh, really fun conversation about that. Patrick and I had, had never played it before, mm-hmm. so that was fun to check out. And uh, yeah, is next- it announcement time? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So we've decided the game that we're going to do for April. Uh, Mark and I had like an honest heart to heart to be like, "Hey, I don't think I've ever actually beaten this game," and you were like, "I've never beaten that game either." We're going to be playing Sonic the Hedgehog two on the Sega Genesis, because it's available on Nintendo Switch Online Plus Expansion Pack. So play along with us. We'll be talking about Sonic the Hedgehog 2 in a couple weeks. Yeah, super excited for that. Uh, Okay, now we're getting back into the proper order. Join the Discord Nintendo Cartridge Society at at gmail.com, and I will send you an invitation. Uh, You can join the Discord and talk about Nintendo and this show. And And vacuum cleaners. And vacuum cleaners, thank you. Um, We're going to have to create a whole channel. I'm not doing that. <laughs> Let's put it in latest episode discussion <laughs> for the next week. Um, uh, also, just a, a fun reminder. I've been saying uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles source book number one written by me is out there and in comic book stores already. Uh, but guess what? Issue two is out this Wednesday. Were we ever so young that uh, issue one was just coming out? Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. It's still I'm Mark. I'm back in like crunch mode for deadline on issue four. Uh, and okay, I love this project. It's near and, and, and dear to me. I'm so happy that I'm doing it. I want it to be over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but everyone, uh, j- check that out if you uh, like what I have to say about stuff or you like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as they are represented in the IDW comics. Um, check, it, uh, check them out. Issue 2 is all about uh, Dimension X and uh, stuff from outer space uh, and is a super cool, fun issue with a lot of uh, crazy little details in it. So check that out. Mark, let's get into what we've been playing this week and what we've been playing the week uh, before. Well, that's never happened that's before. That's never happened before. I don't know what did just happen. <laughs> the music Is cue time just... collapsing in on itself? I don't know. Did a, wor- did a small wormhole just open? I think it's possible that a small wormhole opened. And uh, like swallowed. We just a lost a second. Of the, yeah. yeah of, the, of the music cue. Uh, but fear not, listener. There's nothing wrong with your phone. I don't think. Uh, that happened to us, too. <laughs> we all experienced that together. Uh, Mark, one thing I wanted to touch on. Um, I brought, you know, I was traveling this last week. I was in Florida. Um, and I brought, I, this, I know this makes me insane. But I brought both my Nintendo Switch and my PlayStation Portal with me to Florida because, you know, obviously I had to play Kirby uh, Tilt and Tumble, but I really wanted to spend some time playing Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and I thought the only way I could do this is on the Portal. I'm not packing a PlayStation 5. Uh, I'm not a maniac. Um, But happy to report that using the PlayStation Portal, even from... 3,000 miles away, it pinging my PlayStation 5 in Los Angeles and beaming that all the way over to Southern Florida uh, worked kind of great. Sort of a seamless gameplay experience. That's really cool. How are you liking Rebirth? Uh, I'm liking Rebirth a lot. Uh, It is uh, a chapel to the excesses of Final Fantasy VII um, and uh, is... I don't know. It's it's very much 
uh, like maximalist for the s- uh, sake of being maximalist that like every tiny detail from the original game is blown out to just like uh, uh, um, remake was uh, blown out into like huge, uh, huge like gameplay moments. Um, and everything just feels like, I don't know. It's, st- it's starting to me to feel like uh, purposeful and intentional that the original game is about trying, like struggling to find meaning amongst all this modernity and all the excesses of like the Shinra corporation and I think that's what these remake games are making a little bit more like literal and a little more like front and center where like there's so much stuff in them. Uh, and yet it is like the moments between the characters that are the most resonant. I think that's very interesting and feeds into the themes of the game. Uh, and I'm reading it a little bit too much like uh, an English major, but like, what are you going to do? Uh, I'm, I'm finding it very um, compelling. I am going to have to put it on the back burner for the next couple of weeks while I wrap up Turtles. Uh, but I am so excited to dig deeper into it one of the things that i am not really sure of and so i'm interested in your take is it doesn't really seem like a you know it's not like a traditional sequel and so do they introduce new gameplay mechanics in a way that a sequel would or does it play basically like final fantasy 7 rebirth yeah both things are true okay um so it, it plays an awful lot like rebirth um, but there are new systems uh, like introduced right away that change uh, like the, the dynamics in combat. Uh, and then there's also just, uh, you know, it doesn't take too long for it to introduce you to the open world, which is not like truly, well, I mean, like it just is open. Like you are in like a big, big, like uh, not empty uh, space, but like a natural space, which is so not the way that the very linear first game, which takes place all inside Midgar, uh, really works. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it immediately feels different. And then uh, I've encountered very few of them so far, but the game is chock full of mini games that are not present in uh, the original. So uh, there's a, a card game called Queen's Blood that everyone plays uh, within the game which is uh, oddly fun. I'm really enjoying the matches of Queen's Blood that I get drawn into in that. Um, and, you know, so that's like a, like a, a hook, a main part of the game that is not present in, uh, in Remake. Yeah, it's, yeah, interesting. Interesting to be a, like, sequel, but not sequel. I can understand, yeah, like, it it's... feels like the development of these games would be really challenging for so many reasons. Mm-hmm. And that's another one of them, right? Because, like, uh, the expectation when there's a, new game in a franchise is that it's introducing some i mean think of tears of the kingdom they introduced right. all these crazy new uh features and systems and gameplay mechanics and it's like well final fantasy 7 uh rebirth is kind of like a continuation but it's also a sequel yes plus you're trying to balance all the story elements and the right. new stuff you're trying to do oh well, and there's like the the question of like leveling too where it's like well you know i worked on my specific characters to level them up in specific ways and that doesn't carry over they're just like a handful of things that when you start the game it checks like oh did you play the original final fantasy 7 remake did you play the intermission? Did you play the demo? And you get like little rewards in uh, Rebirth based on those things. So like if you finished intermission, you get the Leviathan uh, summon or I think it's Leviathan. It's, it's one of them summoning material that like you got through the course of that uh, mission uh, is now in your inventory. Do you have all of the moves that you had at the end of the first game? No. Oh, okay. You do not. Um, and like the leveling sort of like, you know, resets. Um, but there's the the game starts with a with a flashback to uh, Nibelheim and it, it, Sephiroth burning the place down, uh, which is a playable flashback in the original Final Fantasy VII, um, and uh, is playable here as well. Uh, and all the character levels are like way off. Like you're playing as uh, Cloud and Sephiroth, and they're both like level thirty. And then when you get back to like regular time, their levels are fifteen. Um, so there's a, there's some sort of like messing with your mind happening there, but then there's also like, yeah, it's, I don't know how much do I want to spoil Final Fantasy seven? That is, uh, there's an explanation for that, uh, in, uh, like in the story, uh, that I wonder how much of that is what they're genuinely playing with. Rebirth is doing such a great job of, uh, addressing your familiarity with the original Final Fantasy seven and twisting it and uh, like exploring those twists as 
like a, a meaningful reflection of who these characters are. Uh, so like everything it's doing, I'm in love with. Uh, and I, that's all I want to do, but I, I cannot. <laughs> yeah. That man, that whole project is so interesting to me. It's fascinating. And like there, it, there's an obvious like bit of diminishing returns, right? Cause like, why would you just pick up rebirth, right? Like, uh, rebirth feels like a game that you're only going to play if you have already played remake. Um, and in some ways remake almost feels like a game that you wouldn't necessarily pick up unless you'd played the original. So like it's the 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 sequel problem that doesn't normally hit games right like for whatever reason games just like sell more and more and more as franchises go on um but like i know that in the early days here final fantasy 7 rebirth is not selling as well as remake uh and i think it's just because there's like one more barrier to entries that you've had you don't have to have beaten the original uh final fantasy 7 remake but like it sure helps i also think that there's probably some amount of you know, like the Star Wars sequel movies to it. You mm. know, that first one, the Final Fantasy VII remake, there was so much hype around right, it. Right. Uh, it was such a big deal that there were probably people who picked it up who, you know, they sampled it. Maybe it, it wasn't for them. Sure. And so they're going to bounce off that second one. You right. know, and the, the, you're, you're totally right. Like the audience is just going to get more and more right. self-selecting. And they got to do this one more time. At right? least. Like, but, right. I mean, I, I think the idea is to finish it up in a third game. But like a third game is going to sell worse than the two previous uh and it will probably cost more to develop <laughs> so I, I i don't know we, we've gotten way too deep into playstation yeah let's here. talk about let's talk about princess peach showtime let's talk about princess peach showtime uh first of all i did not play it while i was away because i did not have my pink joy cons yet and so far to date i have not played a second of this game on anything but the pink joy cons a man of your word that's yes i am i am that Mark, how are, how are you enjoying Princess Peach Showtime? You know, um, after I played the demo, I did not, I was not particularly looking forward to it. I am enjoying Princess Peach Showtime more than I thought I would. Yes. Based on the demo. Um, I am, I'm disappointed. I mean, after the demo came out, I was, I had talked about how I wish that Nintendo in-house had developed a yes. Princess Peach game. And then, because I just think it would have been better, more interesting. Right. Well, and, and the sort of, like, crux of that being that, like, Nintendo in-house developed the first Wario Land game, developed the first Yoshi game, developed the first uh, Luigi's Mansion game. And it's not until those sequels to those games that they get farmed out to, you know, Next Level Games or uh, Good Feel or whoever. Um to like sort of do their own spin on a now well-established formula. This is a first time out, uh, you know, third party studio taking a crack at making this character based game. Yeah. And I feel like really the major disappointment for me is I'm talking about like Luigi's mansion. Yes. We learned something about Luigi. Right. From that game. And I can feel you sighing at the like, triviality of like learning something about luigi but i get what but you're saying did, yes right we did. like we there was a did. new dimension to him where mm -hmm. he is a scaredy cat mm -hmm. but he uh finds the bravery within yep to we got new characters we got you know what i mean like we we, we built a world around we built luigi, a world right. around luigi and that has carried on in luigi's character and other games like that's just become a part of like who luigi is yes and i feel like the thing that i'm missing that i was excited about when this game was announced but th that i am missing from princess peach showtime is any additional color on who princess peach is right and partially that's because all of her all of what makes her special in this game is based around transformations her becoming something she's not right um and so like i like sword fighter peach i like cowgirl peach but i'm like is that am i getting anything about her in that you don't even really get the sense that she like wants to be an actress or right. you know like sometimes she's a singer or you know whatever um and it's just like no that's just she like is magically forced into doing these things yeah it's like she's she is treated kind of like i feel like she's always treated which is like a doll that you put new right, outfits on right, right rather than 
yeah, being like internally motivated to do any of this stuff. Right. And, you know, it's possible that towards the end of this game, she has a Barbie like transformation <laughs> and talks with Rhea Perlman in the afterlife. Yeah, it's possible. But I doubt it. Yeah. I mean, like, I kind of doubt it. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, I, I'm for sure continuing to play in case that happens. <laughs> but no, I mean, like, really, like, I, I, I'm enjoying it fine. I like, yes. Um, and I, I uh, can imagine, and this is not like a slide on the game, but I can imagine my four year old niece absolutely being enchanted by this. Well, so let me speak to that for a second. Uh, Sarah, who is not four years old, but is in fact 40, um, she's playing this game. Um, and like, you know, uh, I, I've talked about on the show that, you know, Sarah plays games, but her the games that she plays, she's pretty selective about, right? Um, she likes Mario games. Uh, she played all the way through Odyssey, all the way through 3D World, plays Tetris. She loved Animal Crossing. Um, and... Uh, when I get a new game, I always say like, Hey, I got this. If you want to play it, like, you know, it's, you can. Um, and I, ex yeah, I told her like, I got uh, princess Peach showtime. Uh, and I sort of expected the normal, like kind of shrug and like, okay, yeah, thanks. You know? Um, and then she'll never play it, but she's at home playing it right now. Like I left and she was playing it. Um, and, uh, she played it, uh, on, uh, you know, a little bit yesterday and like, I picked up sticks for a little while to play and then I put it down and she was like, now me. And I was like, oh yeah, sure. Whatever. Go ahead. So she is really into it. Oh, that's great. Um, and I think part of it is, uh, that it, it like, the, it's not super challenging. So like, even when she doesn't know exactly what to do on, on a, a given screen, she can just like sort of penalty free ex uh, experiment uh until like she figures it out. Um and I think that's just exactly where she is with like a gameplay experience right now. She doesn't want something that's going to like punish her. She just wants something fun and cute. Yeah, it doesn't need to be Dark Souls. It does not need to be Dark Souls, although we did need to talk about the parry mechanic with the <laughs> the sword fighter peach. Um but yeah, it's uh, I I I'm also like you uh like enjoying it. Um but I've sort of had to recalibrate what I expect of my gameplay experience because it is not, I'm really just playing the game to uh, witness the like little uh, vignettes and like the kind of visual jokes and like all this kind of stuff that are just like cute and clever and fun, uh, which the game has in spades. Totally. Um, but like, yeah, the, the sort of like a uh, collector impulse in me that like wants to get all of the little shiny green gem things. Uh, when I miss one, I'm like, Oh, I'm going to have to like go back in. And then I'm like, no, just don't do that. Cause like you've experienced the fun of the level. Uh, don't go back into it. And just like, it's just, like, you know, watching the same eight minute cartoon again. Well, I also feel uh, like the levels are a little too long for me to want to go Absolutely, back and do that. Yes. And there's no, um, there's no way to, It'll gate you uh, out of areas like once you've passed them uh, within like a level. Uh, so if you pick up one of those gems and you see that you've missed one, you can't just go back and get it, which I find frustrating. Do you know what I think is interesting? And it, um, it's obviously like a purposeful choice is when you get a new transformation or you enter an area where yes. the game doesn't stop and explain the mechanic to you. You have to, yes. like the, the little ribbon character whose name I'm forgetting. Stella. Right. Stella. You, there's a prompt that you can press X and see the control scheme, and then Stella explains to you what you're supposed to do on the screen. Yeah. But the game does not go out of its way to tutorialize, like, this is how you control this character in this right. mode or anything right. like that. Which I wonder if that goes back to your, you know, Sarah's experience with it, where she, you know, is just able to enjoy it for, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't know that the mechanics are really the important part of that game because the game is very yes, um, it's intuitive. In it's a lot intuitive of ways. and it's, it's pretty forgiving. Like it's yeah. not, it's not about like frame perfect button presses. No, I uh, very much not about. Fr and also like uh, there are no lives in the game. When you die, uh, you lose ten coins, um, but only of the coins that you've collected in the, in that level on that particular run. So like, yeah, and, and if you have zero coins, it just like puts you back at the beginning like it it doesn't care um like there's really no penalty for failure other than having to go back a little bit the game does do a really good job of but like you said those moments yeah like i played the mermaid mm -hmm. and it it's it is fun how different each of them are absolutely and uh you know and they all kind of 
more or less culminate in like a moment, but some of them do it better than others. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm excited. I'm actually, I'm really excited to talk about, I think on Thursday when we talk about like the individual transformations, because some of them, like, I, it's weird. It's like, I d- didn't really enjoy it, but I appreciated what it was trying to do. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's such a strange game. Um, uh, and I do like, it does still feel like a Nintendo game. I've complained before <clears throat> about like the performance of the game, uh, and how it is like a little choppy and like. It can be especially jarring in the loading screens of all of all places where like there's a sort of like rippling uh red curtain uh and you're like that curtain is moving at like eight frames a second, like it is really choppy. Um and then it will at first I was like, well maybe that's like a design choice that they like want to do that, but then towards the end of the loading screen it'll like go back into smooth animation. You're like, oh no, they just cannot it's thinking too hard about what it's gonna load for the next level. But all of that uh notwithstanding, I think the art design uh, in the game is great, and um, the music I think is really good too. Like I'm, I'm really enjoying uh, the. It's it's got more of a uh, like Busby Berkeley uh, like take on the uh, Mario or like Nintendo music um, that feels just a little bit more musical theater uh, that I'm uh, enjoying quite a bit. It also has some of those fun like touches that I associate with Nintendo, like you know, Princess Peach can slide down the banister and right. just things yes. like that. Just like those moments that are like, you try it, you're like, can, what happens if I try this? Right. And then it does. And yeah. it does something. Yeah. Uh, also, when she starts the level, she says, peach time, <laughs> which is great. I like that she has, she has little catchphrases for each of mm-hmm. her transformations. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's an interesting game. It's not, not what I thought it was going to be. It's better in some regards, not as good in others yeah um but it's also one where you're like what would they do if they get another shot at it totally yeah well (laughs) get another shot it's also just like will nintendo care about this ever again like who knows especially a game not developed by them originally uh you know we've had this conversation about like donkey kong country and how that's always sort of been seen internally as like a little bit of an outside thing because it was originally developed by rare and then the wii and wii u games were developed by retro um so yeah, I just like I wonder if main like in-house Nintendo ever goes back to this. I know. I I hope that if like I have no sense for how well this game is doing sales-wise or anything like that. But I hope if it doesn't meet internal expectations that we don't get another 10-year hibernation of Princess Peach games. Right. Like I hope the lesson they learn is not that people don't want Princess Peach games. It's right. Is like we just need another crack at it. Well, what's what's interesting is like uh so uh Yoshi's Woolly World and Yoshi's Crafted World came out within what like four years of each other um and like Woolly World couldn't have sold that well because it was a Wii U game so like uh you know and, and those are also good feel right um uh, and not to say that Crafted World is an improvement on it but it's another bite at the apple um and so like it does just make me wonder if like this can follow that same sort of trajectory of like yeah just like try to make another one uh, have you done the sword fighter rehearsal? Yes, I've tried. So this is interesting, isn't it? Because it's a little bit of a challenge mode inside the game that like has you doing a high score chase that is genuinely difficult. <laughs> I can't, I I have not been able to get. I've not been able to get a gold fifty. It's one hundred sixty. One hundred sixty. Yeah. I've gotten one hundred and fifty nine. Whoa, what? Yeah. One time. One time. But I wasn't yeah. able to get the 160. Uh, I, I got 137 is as high as, I, as I've gotten. Um, but, like, it's a thing that you need to, like, keep trying. Like, I don't think people are going to get it on their first try, whereas just about everything else in the game you can. Uh-huh. Um, but, yeah, I, 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 after discovering that, I was like, wait, how many of these are there in this game? Like, do they let you do channel or rehearsals for uh, other transformations? And are they all, like, fun and hard hard like this um uh as always with these sorts of things i wish there was a faster like to start again uh option um but yeah like a weirdly cool challenging thing hidden in uh princess peach showtime how are you feeling about the feats in our um discord there's some polarizing discussion around feats seems like people either love or hate them these are the little characters that Uh, populate the theater. They have big bulbous noses that big like light up noses. like Christmas yeah. lights when they speak. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So 
I I don't I don't love them. Uh, I do think they need to be pretty featureless so that when they appear in the plays, it's not overly confusing to see them in different costumes. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of lukewarm on them. How how do you feel about the Thetes? I I think they're kind of cute. All right, Mark thinks they're kind of cute. I like the Thetes. They remind me of like a like a 1930s like cartoon character or even kind of Olimar yeah. with the big nose. <laughs> they do look a little bit like Olimar. Um uh there was I was uh jumping into the second sword fighter level and it starts with like you're in a cell with two of them, two thetes, and I started like swinging my sword at him and Sarah was like, "No, those are your friends." <laughs> Which I thought was adorable. <laughs> There's also an interesting speaking of the thetes, uh at the beginning of every level uh, you before you get the transformation for the yeah. first time, you go through a little bit of rigmarole where you know the thetes are like, "Oh, the cookies! We love the cookies! Oh no, the cookies are stolen!" Right? Now, can you help us get the cookies? But then there's always a couple of characters, a couple of thetes mm. that they're like standing in front of a door, but they are filled with self doubt. They're yes. like, I'm, I can't open this door, or I'm too scared to open this door. Right, and you need to use your spirit ribbon or whatever it's called to like. Make them happy yeah. by hitting them with it. <laughs> right. And it like it jazzes them up and they're like, no, right. we can do it. And then they can open the door for you and that sort of thing. It's it's um kind of like a throwaway mechanic, you know. Yes. But but it's interesting that it's in every it's like one of the themes of the game, I guess. Well, yes, yes. Uh, th- but the thing is, that only happens in levels where you don't start as in a transformation. When you do like the second round of all these things, you just start mm-hmm. as sword fighter peach or whoever um but yeah every time that you are taught a new transformation first you have to just like be normal and the way that peach is normal is that she cheers people up with her ribbon uh anything else on princess peach showtime no but like i said i'm excited to talk about it more on thursday yes uh also uh we both this last week have been playing Kirby Tilt and Tumble, but if you would like to hear more about that, you got to go on over to Patreon um, and listen to our conversation there. All right, Mark, that's what we've been playing this week. Let's get into the new releases and what we might be playing next week. Okay, so that time there was no ding at the end of it. Yeah. All right, all right. We've got we've got something going on here. I think my computer is haunted. Um. But the recording is still going great, so we're just going to keep going. Um, Mark, what's out this week? All right. So uh, we've made it through the first quarter of the year, and we are now into April. And according to... I saw this on Threads. Tokyo Game Life on Threads posted that April is the first month since May 2022 that Nintendo has no games, expansions, or major updates announced. Interesting. Does it feel, I mean, it feels for sure like we're at the end of the Switch's life, right? Um, but, I mean, it's starting to feel like the end of every other uh, Nintendo console's life where it's just like, uh-oh, we don't have anything. Yeah, it's like we're just twiddling our thumbs, uh, like us as gamers, Yeah, uh, waiting for to find out what the deal is. Trying to find out what the deal is, yeah. And there were rumors that in March we were going to get an Indie World Showcase. And I, for the life of me, can't remember if the same people who were saying that were also saying, because there have been, there have also been rumors of a regular Nintendo Direct right. in April. Right. Which we're in now. Oh, yes. But didn't have that, uh, as you say, Indie World Showcase in March. I feel like we're just all the way off the map here. Yeah, I think so too. Um, which, uh, not a comfortable place to be. Uh, especially when the rest of the industry is in like whatever dire straits it's in, uh, where I'm kind of like, I mean, this is Nintendo's opportunity to uh, either like stay the course, but is staying the course messing up at this point, uh, or to mess it up in like a more dramatic way. And I just we I, I just feel like we don't know anything. Yeah, right I, I yeah, and it's even it's even like you said we're so far off the map that it's even hard to speculate. Yeah, I mean. That won't stop us. <laughs> no. Oh, heaven forbid. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we have two weeks of new releases to catch up on. So last Tuesday, March 26th, South Park Snow Day was released. And we saw this in the February Direct. Mm-hmm. A, uh, a, a weird sort of application of the South Park license that feels very much like something from the Nintendo 64 days. Uh, which just feels odd to me because Ubisoft had so much success with those role-playing games. 
um, the uh, stick of truth and the uh, fractured butthole. Um, that it's uh, it's weird to me that they are taking a different tact with this game uh, and just being like, yeah, it's a like third per- third person shooter like cooperative kind of game. I don't know. Uh, it I, I I don't understand why do this and why do this now. And then last Thursday on March twenty eighth, Pepper Grinder was released. Cool. And uh, Felix the Cat. The, it's a bundle of two classic, classic, I'm reading copy, They're in quotes. It's in quotes. <laughs> uh, Felix the Cat titles. Felix the Cat, the NES version, and Felix the Cat, Game Boy version. Uh, of course, it has some uh, modern niceties, like being able to save and rewind game progression at any time. But, Patrick, did Felix the Cat, like, these are games that I never played on the Nintendo right. Entertainment System. I never played on the Game Boy. The, these are games that mean nothing to me. Uh, they're also games that mean nothing to me, but Felix the Cat is always, uh, you know, something of, uh, like a curiosity or like anomaly for me. It's so old, um, but like is one of those things that kind of like stuck around, right? Felix the Cat's from like 1960, right? I think it's even older than that. Maybe even older. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, uh, uh, the silent film era. Okay, I just uh, lo- looked it up. Um, the first episode is uh, 1958 of Felix the Cat. Um, but regardless, um, it's, a uh, it's old stuff. Um, and the fact that there were NES games for these kind of like old licensed properties is so funny to me that there were like three Stooges games. Yeah. Uh, that, that at, at that time when we were so far away from like the movies, uh, like bringing them back into popularity, there was an Adams family game, right? The Fester's quest. Um, like what was what was happening? Where it's just like here's this twenty year old, thirty year old property. We're just like surfacing for for Nintendo. I mean, I think it's exactly that. It's like if when they um, re released, um, oh, what was that game? Uh, Scott Pilgrim versus the World. Yes, right. I mean, that was like a twenty year old property. You know what I mean? It's that's, like right, but that's the, that's re releasing it. It, it, was, it was the nostalgia cycle yes. for. Uh, our parents, right? Just like those sorts of games are the nostalgia cycle for us. Yes, no, and I agree with that. But that's just re-releasing a video game. Yeah, but like in the eighties, they didn't exist. That's a great point. They <laughs> they had to come from somewhere. But I, okay, but it's like something that hasn't been touched in that much time. Right. So like, if there was uh like a uh. And this got a reboot, so I guess it doesn't count. But if there was a Will and Grace video game that no, came but out that's now, what I'm saying. all these things were like, what can I think of that got a reboot that and didn't get a reboot? That yeah. didn't get a reboot. And It'd it's, be like, it's, a, it's this is a Wings video game. <laughs> How has that not happened yet? <laughs> I don't know. Let's see a Becker video game. Um, so Felix the Cat coming out, <laughs> and then on Friday, March 29th, we got. Uh, F Zero Maximum Velocity for the Nintendo Switch Online Plus Expansion Pack. This is the Game Boy Advance, one of the Game Boy Advance F Zero games, and it is the final game that was previously revealed for Game Boy Advance on Nintendo Switch Online. Right. So this is another case where we are now off the map uh, because we have reached those uh, milestones for the Game Boy and the Nintendo sixty four as well. Every game that they have promised us for uh, all six of the platforms that are available on NSO and NSO Plus Expansion Pack have been delivered. Mark, we're off the map. So, I... And, you know, in that time, we have also received games that Other weren't ones, yeah. announced. But... Including some, including some cool ones, right? Like, we got that... Uh, the second Golden Sun game where they had only promised the first. Um, uh, Kirby Tilt and Tumble is one of those that was not promised, but we, we got anyway. Um, I think think maybe i'm wrong on that um but yeah so we they could at any time drop more uh games on on either uh either the uh, or any of the platforms uh but yeah where we nothing we have nothing else promised to us strange times mm-hmm. also strange because i looked at the new releases for this week and there are of course games coming out but nothing that stood out to me or that i recognized or anything like that uh, but there are a lot of sales going on in the eShop right now, including a partner spotlight sale. With um, there, uh, There is a ton that's on sale right now at really good yeah. prices. Yep. So worth checking that out if there are 
any games you've had an eye on, some that have been in your wish list, uh, worth seeing if they're on sale right now. Um, all right. Well, so we're going to get out of the new releases right now, which means I'm going to play this sound effect. And this is going to be the last time that if it goes weird, that we're actually going to use it. Uh, otherwise, if this goes weird, then I will just punch the sound cues in afterwards. And I'm keeping this explanation in here. Uh, all right, Mark, let's get out of the new releases. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, which brings us to a regular segment on our show, which we do know, 433. In 1952, American composer John Cage wrote a piece called 433, wherein a performer or a group of performers didn't play their instruments for four minutes and 33 seconds. For the purposes of this show, our instruments are talking about Nintendo. So for the, for the duration of one performance of 433, Mark and I will talk about something not at all Nintendo-related, thus fulfilling the contract of the piece. Uh, today, I want to talk about zoos. Mm -hmm. Mark, in Florida, I went to a sort of zoo, um, the uh, Wonder Garden in Bonita Springs, um, which is a like Florida dirtbag zoo, basically. <laughs> uh, so, wait, 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 explain. So it's a zoo. It's small. It's all like local Florida animals, and there's a lot of like rescues, uh, animals that uh, people would purchase as pets that they don't want anymore. It feels very tourist trappy, and it's just like kind of scuzzy. Uh, it not an unpleasant experience. I had fun. We walked around for like uh, an hour and ten minutes, maybe. And that was enough uh, Wonder Gardens for me. Um, but like right when you walk out, there's uh, just a bunch of parrots uh, or parakeets, whatever the big ones are that people get as pets that live for like 100 years. Um, uh, and they all have like little name tags and they were all bright colors and all like different. And it felt for a minute like I was in the Enchanted Tiki Room and I liked that. Um, but yeah, just like going to that zoo in particular, but all zoos, I think, uh, a little depressing. I feel like the um, the feel of a zoo is really based on its enclosures. Yes. And how... It's like, how much guilt do I feel? Or yes. how like sad do I feel for this animal? And I've got to say, like, I feel like the LA Zoo, not a particularly good zoo on that scale. So I, uh, despite the fact that I live right by that zoo, have never been. It is fine. Mm -hmm. but I But I don't feel like... The enclosures don't fill me with wonder. Mm -mm. You know, I'm not like, wow, what an oasis for these elephants. Right. It's like, yeah, this is this is a pretty big concrete pit for these elephants. Like it's a it's spacious. <laughs> right. But it doesn't But it's still a pit. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how I feel about the LA Zoo. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, you know, one of the things that like so there's a there's an alligator enclosure at this uh uh Wonder Gardens. Um and there are 14 alligators or something like that in in this uh, enclosure and it's not very big so like on one hand i'm like oh those poor alligators but then the other hand i'm like otherwise they'd just be like in a golf course <laughs> you know like ca causing <laughs> causing like problems <laughs> so like i guess it's better that they're here but like it's hard to escape the fact that they're just like in animal jail uh-huh although i guess like you're saying if it is a rescue the alternative right is that Worse. yeah, yeah. Uh, that it gets hunted and uh, mm -hmm. killed us and not be a, a problem. Wonder Gardens also, and I've, I promise this whole segment is not just about Wonder Gardens, uh, has loose iguanas. Fun. Um, uh, one startled Sarah as it scurried up a tree like right next to her. <laughs> Uh, as you would imagine, yeah, because it's a big, it's a big iguana, right? Like probably uh, two and a half feet plus a tail. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it can be alarming to just have one of those scurry by you. <coughs> Do you have a zoo that like you visited as a kid that you have any kind of fondness for? Yeah, I remember before uh, it. Now it is owned by the same nonprofit. I'm gonna guess <laughs> as the San Diego Zoo. So it's called like the San Diego wild animal park or san sure. diego zoo wild animal park but at the time it was separate it was just like the wild uh like wild animal park and it had a big savanna oh it's one of those that you drive and through? it has no it has a uh oh. it, it had a tram yeah that like took you around the perimeter and that was really cool as a kid because the way that they had it designed and i'm sure it seems like disney probably ripped this off a Animal Kingdom yeah. at Disney World, they have a safari that takes you, uh, you know, you're on a truck and it takes you through these different 
enclosures, but it's made, it has the illusion of all being one, like, open savanna. Right. Even though it's designed in ways so, like, certain species can't get at each other. Right. It's really cool. Because you don't want to see a lion eating any animals. It, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. But, so I feel like Disney probably used this for inspiration, and I think it still exists. Like, it's the, now, like, the San Diego Zoo Wild Animal Park, and... I just remember it being very cool because it was this big open like savanna like yeah. space. And so you're removed from the animals, but you could see, you know, when you're 10, what appeared to be uh, the normal like life, like what these animals would do yeah. in the wild. That was pretty cool. It feels less like animal prison. Yeah. Uh, all right. We were accompanied today by a timer on my phone because we got into a whole conversation about... Uh, uh, I was looking for a 433 and found a timer on YouTube for 433. And we got into a whole conversation about timers on YouTube. Check it out. There is a guy who puts up, uh, there's a 20 minute timer that he has that has uh, f- like 41 million views or something. Uh, we- we're trying to wrap our heads around the economics of this, but we can't get into that now. Mark, let's get into the news. <laughs> and that one worked too. <laughs> Last week, Kotaku reported that Nintendo of America is restructuring its testing group in a move estimated to affect over 100 contractors. Uh, so when we say estimated to affect one, over 100 contractors, we mean those contractors probably don't have work anymore? So, um, well, here's what Kotaku says. Yeah. Quote, according to four current and former employees, the restructuring could affect over 100 contractors, mm. and most of those being converted to full-time status appear to be getting moved out of software testing. So here's what Nintendo says. For yeah. Nintendo's part, they say, quote, these changes will involve some con- contractor assignment ending, as well as the creation of a significant number of new t- full-time employee positions. For all assignments that are ending, the contractor is agencies with Nintendo of America support will offer severance packages and provide assistance during their transition. Okay. So we don't know numbers for sure. What we do know is that there is a significant change happening in Nintendo's te- Nintendo of America's testing group and that the according to Kotaku, the uh, people who are being converted from contractors to full-time employees are being moved out of software testing entirely. Right, so it sounds like what Nintendo needs right now is not testers out of Nintendo of America. Yeah, so this is, uh, Kotaku continues, quote, The shift also comes during a recent lull in Nintendo of America's testing department, three contractors told Kotaku. They said that there had been no major, no new major first-party games in the testing pipeline, and none of them were aware of anyone having hands-on time with the upcoming Switch 2 despite previous hopes that it would arrive as early as the second half of 2024. Although some of us analysts knew better than to say 2024. I've been saying 2025 for the last three years. They also weren't sure how Nintendo of America could... This part is interesting to me. They also weren't sure how Nintendo of America could continue to test massive games like last year's The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, which was praised for its technical performance and lack of bugs, with the new cuts. Nintendo declined to comment on the status of its testing pipeline. Uh, Okay, so... I mean, all of which is to say this supposes that there are no big first party games in the playtesting state at this moment. Yeah. Or very few of them. Yep. Right. Um, uh, or very few that they want slash need uh, American testers on. Like it, it's possible that that gets outsourced or is even more internal and that they're doing it all in Japan. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's unclear what, what exactly this means, except that there is no big Tears of the Kingdom-like game on the horizon, even within the next year. Well, th- that's where it's, it's really hard to say, right? Because we, I mean, it seems logical mm-hmm. on the one hand that that would be true, but Nintendo could be changing the way that they do testing entirely and maybe they're bringing, sure you know like maybe they are doing more testing in japan so they just need a smaller group to do it in uh for nintendo of america right maybe or maybe there really isn't anything on the horizon in the immediate so they are scaling way back but they could theoretically scale up again right when like the time comes so it, 
I feel like. Let me ask you this. Okay. Is it possible that uh, some number of these uh, playtesting jobs uh, go to AI? Because there is there are like limited applications for AI in, in game development, but uh, pointing out, uh, you know, like things that break the game experience could well be handled by, by AI. Like that's one of the uh, things that I've seen uh, most analysts say like, you can't like AI is not a substitute for an artist of any kind, uh, and not to say that uh, testers aren't uh, you know contributing actively to the development process. But like, I wonder if that's part of what they're preparing for. I wonder if that's like a, a shift that we're going to see in the industry to smaller playtesting teams um, and more use of AI to test stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I really don't know. I mean, it, that totally could be. I really don't know what to make of this. I I feel like at with the Switch pipeline being what it is and, and rumors that we're not going to have new Nintendo hardware until sometime next year, it does make you wonder, like, yeah, I mean, maybe Nintendo really was just cla- caught flat-footed mm. by needing to do this delay. Yeah. And so they don't really have much going on in 2024. I keep expecting there to be some sort of presentation or announcement that of something for the holidays and i obviously there is going to be some sort of game right that'll be coming out but what that fall. is is a, is a total mystery right and like i think we can rule out like a mario or a zelda we know that uh pokemon legends uh is going to come out next year um so like we're starting to like cross out the sort of reliable players in the holiday season uh and what's there to replace it Right, and are we looking at another, you know, like, um, B or solid triple, like, Princess Peach Showtime, you know, that's developed right. by the third party, and I don't know what the uh, testing pipeline is like when Goodfeel is developing a game yeah. versus, yeah, yeah. you know, like, does Nintendo of America handle the That's a great question. For that? Like, I, I, I mean, don't know how that yeah, works. Yeah, or, or, like, Intelligent System, like... If we've got a new uh, Fire Emblem game coming out, which would also be quick, that'd be fast. Um, less than two years since uh, uh, Engage came out. Um, but like, yeah, the Nintendo's normal um, third party uh, partners, uh, would they be, uh, who, who tests those games, I guess. Also interesting that you and I have talked about the general state of the video game industry and how a lot of the big players have been laying off a significant amount yes. of employees and that Nintendo hadn't really been affected to that. But this is potentially an example of, you know, this is Nintendo's first big layoff that we've heard about since all of, you know, the past couple of years when there's been all of these industry layoffs. So maybe it is just part of their like restructuring or taking yeah. the opportunity to reduce costs while they don't have a lot of other stuff going on in the pipeline. I, I mean, I, I hear that, but it's also like they're taking a lot of freelancers and making them full time, which represents a higher cost to them per employee. Um, and then also offering severance packages to freelance workers, which is pretty good as far as like how a, a company the size of Nintendo treats freelance employees. Like that, that that's pretty good is all is, uh, I, I agree that like it is all part of that same trend towards like cutting costs, especially uh, where um, you know human labor is concerned. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. It feels like Nintendo's on like at least the gentler side of that. Last week, Nintendo released an update for F zero ninety nine that brings several new features. Version one point three point zero includes mirror tracks. Mm-hmm. The usual tracks are flipped horizontally, and tracks where the gimmicks are rearranged will ap- appear. Uh, where the gimmicks are rearranged, so like where there are like jumps and like fun stuff like that. That so basically they they switch the left yeah, and this, right. Does this sentence make sense? I don't know. And tracks where the gimmicks are rearranged will appear. Will appear. The usual tracks are flipped horizontally. Are these two separate thoughts? So, and tracks where gi- where the gimmicks are. are rearranged will appear. So that doesn't mean that there are also tracks with rearranged gimmicks. Wait, 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 wait. What does will appear mean? <laughs> tracks 
where the gimmicks uh-huh. are rearranged, that's a thing, will appear. The following will appear, colon, tracks where the gimmicks are rearranged. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So the gimmicks in some of these tracks, now in some of the mirror tracks, or just in some tracks, in, are there also like rearranged versions? It's the will <laughs> appear that is throwing me. <laughs> okay, here's what I think. Yeah. Here's what I think. Yeah, break it down. The usual tracks are flipped horizontally. Okay. Great. That's awesome. Right. Then there are also tracks and where tracks. they rearrange the gimmicks. Okay. So there are tracks with gimmicks. Uh-huh. Are, and, and they are also flipped horizontally? I'm, I... This is, uh, this is where I, it's yeah, so I difficult. Can't, I, 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 I can't figure that part out yet. <laughs> right. What I do know is that tracks where there are gimmicks, they will <laughs> rearrange those gimmicks, and those tracks will appear. And they're rearranged in... So just all the tracks will appear. The way... <laughs> The way the punctuation, let's, I want to just break it all the way down. The usual tracks are flipped horizontally, comma, and tracks where the gimmicks are rearranged will appear. This is another great moment in, in uh, copywriting. In copywriting. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I know I this don't, is I perplexing. Um, here's something we do know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> mirror tracks will appear in F099 races, Pro Tracks, Team Battle, Mini Pre, and Mirror Grand Prix. Right. So it just says you're playing like the regular versions of the game, you will encounter the mirror tracks. Or you could argue mirror tracks will appear. <laughs> Five Mirror Knight League tracks will be added first, and then they'll be adding Mirror Queen and Mirror King League tracks in the future. Okay. So uh, I. I, which all, all sort of indicates that like there's some work that needs to be done on these things, likely rearranging the gimmicks. <laughs> um, that uh, they can't just like, because you would think that a mirror version of a track would be like a pretty easy, right? You're switch, just flipping right? horizontally. Yeah. yeah, it's not like it's like the reverse. Yes, exactly. Um, well, they also added a steer assist feature. Mm-hmm. Quote, this function avoids barriers and rough patches while driving and prevents falling off the course while jumping. Very nice. Very, and also very much like we see in um, uh, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Yep. Um, you can't use steer assist in classic mode, however. Yeah, that makes sense. Practice mode has been expanded. Uh, in addition to the previous 15 courses, classic tracks and mirror tracks are now also unlocked for practice. Okay, very good. They added mini classic mini pre- to special events. It's a three-race series with classic rules and courses. Oh, that's nice, because uh, I think it was five before, uh, which is uh, just... Uh, that's uh, F-Zero classic, but, like, uh, just a little too long. And then they added challenge highlights. You can highlight limited time challenges that can only be attempted... Sorry, I need to go back. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh-huh. Okay, so there's a there's a, a sub, um, uh, like, bullet point here under the uh, added classic mini uh pre to special events that says silence white land 2 and fire field will appear so this is again the terminology will appear and i think that's because in f099 it sort of randomly serves up courses to you right so will appear is just sort of their language for has been added to the game got it okay got it okay right. will it could appear as you are, as it is randomly selecting courses for you to play. This makes a little bit more sense to me now. Okay. You can keep going. Um, let's see. Challenge highlights. You mm-hmm. can highlight limited time challenges that can only be attempted for a set period of time. Challenges relating to on- related to ongoing events and challenges that are close to completion. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and then added boost colors and spin effects for machine customization as well as backdrops, badges, and borders for pilot card customization. It's another case where I just, I mean, I'm just copy editing this now. I would say that uh, added boost colors and spin effects to machine customization, that that's another thing that you can customize on your machine is boost effects and spin effects. So instead of four machine customization, I would say two machine customization. Mm -hmm. But will those customizations 
will appear. They appear. <laughs> yeah, I think I think so. Uh, so more more customization options is basically uh, what what we're seeing here, and then other uh, challenges and balance adjustments. It seems like they are uh, adding a lot of functionality to this game, uh, both in terms of what you can actually do uh, while you're playing online in like competitive matches, and as you're playing by yourself in either classic mode or practice, uh, which is cool to see them uh, giving this thing so much support. Yeah, totally. Team 0%, a group of players that were working to beat all of the levels available for the original Super Mario Brother, Super Mario Maker before online, online is shut down in just a few days, announced two weeks ago they had achieved their goal when they beat a level called The Last Dance. Mm, yes, uh, programmed by Michael Jordan, of course. <laughs> Who, who took that personally or whatever. <laughs> uh, there was a small bit of drama around this as a level called Trimming the Herbs has yet to be beaten, but the creator of that level came forward to admit that it was uploaded illegitimately. Illegitimate upload. So with Super Mario Maker and Super Mario Maker 2, in order to post a level, like share a level online, it had to be beatable. You had right. you had to be able to beat it yourself. It's sort of the last thing at, to that you have to do in order to upload a level. And so, uh, what the creator of this level came forward to say was like, actually, this was never beatable by a human. Uh, I used like um, tool assisted speedrunning tools to trick the system. Right. And so, congrats! Like you, you actually you did, did complete your goal. Yes. Because yes. this was uploaded illegitimately. But interestingly, uh, so congratulations to Team 0%. That's a pretty cool thing to achieve. Mark, have you seen the video of them beating The Last Dance? No, I haven't watched it. The Last Dance is one of these nightmare levels uh, where you're bouncing around at pixel-perfect precision with, like, a, a beetle hat on the whole time. Um, and is like, you know, the video is, like, 10 minutes long, and it is a genuinely stressful experience just to watch it. Um, and... Uh, like, I almost don't even know if I recommend it. You know, like, some speed runs are very, like, exciting to watch or, you know, uh, feats in video gaming. But this is just one of those, like, oh, yeah, someone designed a torture chamber, <laughs> and here you are being tortured by it, and this one person survives. Yeah, this one is at least, because you know it has a happy ending. Yes, yes, that's right. Um, So, worth watching, not worth watching? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because when, when you're watching, like, very hard video game levels uh, be beaten, there's something about, like, you won't have the feeling of, like, wow, if only I practiced more, I could do this. You'll be like, that person's a freak, and they should uh. be ashamed of themselves. <laughs> um, well, one thing that I thought was pretty cool was that the the person who uploaded that Trimming the herb stage illegitimately, they use that same tool to upload a stage called Bombs 5. But human players actually managed to beat that one. Yeah. That is pretty insane. Yeah. Yep. It's been two years since Kirby and the Forgotten Land was released. The soundtrack was amazing. And later this year in Japan, the soundtrack is being released on CD. It arrives September 13th. Comes in two versions. There's Kirby and the Forgotten Land sound selection with 33 tracks on a single disc. Ooh. And then Kirby and the Forgotten Land complete soundtrack which is a four-disc set. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm doing a Time Life commercial. Yeah. Plus extras like a 44-page book, five photo cards, and a photo frame music box that's modeled after the photo frame that appears in Kirby's house at the end of the game. And it can all be yours for five low monthly payments <laughs> exactly. of $39.99. <laughs> it's an expensive set. Um, there's... Okay. Uh, it is not actually that expensive. I'm just making a joke. Um... We, you and I both listen to uh, video game music uh, either on like YouTube or um, Spotify or Apple Music or whatever. There is something in this day and age particularly dorky about uh, like putting on a CD to play the Kirby music. I had the uh, back in the day the four disc uh, soundtrack to Final Fantasy X um, back when it came out on uh, PS2, and I listened to it like kind of a lot um, when I was in college. Uh, but like the, I just feel like times have changed so much in the last 20 years that like, I mean, first of all, where's your CD, where's the CD player in your house? Do you have one? Yeah. I, I genuinely don't know if I have a machine in my house that can play a CD. Um, but I assume you're getting this. Well, that was one th fun thing in Japan is I feel like 
in Japan, physical media hasn't been phased out sure. the way that it's been phased out in America. And so you would go into stores and they would have like still CDs and DVDs and all that kind of stuff. And I remember going into one store and they had the uh, the soundtrack for Metroid Fusion <laughs> on CD. But then they also had like, you know, the uh, Wind Waker or Twilight Princess. Yeah. These like sets and the col- the part of like, I'm gen- generally not like a collector, but there was part of me that was just like, this is so specific and cool. Yeah. That I don't have anything to play it on, but I really just want the Metroid Fusion soundtrack on CD. Yeah, well, and I guess there is something about, uh, and it's not something about, it's that Nintendo is very protective of the the IP of uh, their music. And, you know, they're constantly, like, taking down videos that have uh, Nintendo music in them. But they're also just not widely available on the music streaming platforms. Um, so, like... Yeah, if you want to get the Metroid Dread soundtrack, like, yeah, probably buying the CD is maybe your best bet. Yeah. Yeah. It all just feels very strange. I mean, it, it, like, vinyl, I sort of get, right? Of, like, you have the vinyl, it becomes like a, uh, like a ritual sort of thing. It's this very physical uh, medium. Um, but, yeah, just the uh, turning CDs into that same kind of thing in the year of our Lord 2024 feels crazy. We speculated two weeks ago that a mystery event that was referenced in an update for the mobile game Super Mario Run could be a Princess Peach Showtime event. And hey, turns out it is. Sometimes we guess things accurate. We predict them. We, uh, we are, we're good at this. We, we gaze said... into our crystal balls. <laughs> That's right. We said before that we won't be speculating or it makes it hard to speculate or whatever we said. Um, but sometimes when we speculate, Mark, we're right. <laughs> Occasionally. Princess Peach Showtime, right. <laughs> New Switch in 2025, probably right. <laughs> um, quote, to celebrate the release of Princess Peach Showtime on Nintendo Switch, a set of special missions is now available. Clear them to unlock various brand new decorations as rewards. Patissier Peach Statue, complete three missions. Sword Fighter Peach Statue, complete six missions. And Peach and Stella Statue, complete nine missions. Available until May 7th. Which isn't super long, but, you know, you got about a, an, another month to uh, to get those things. Mark, uh, I was made aware of this uh, because I'm still getting notifications on my phone from the Super Mario Run app. Um, uh, how did you encounter the information that we were having a new event at Super Mario Run? Because you shared it in the Discord. See, so again, like, I am a prophet of, <laughs> of these kinds of things. I'm spreading the good word. Spreading the good word. I don't know why I said spreading. The good word will appear. <laughs> um, do you... Th- uh, yeah. Not to, like, put any thoughts into your mind before we get into this on Thursday. But should but when we talk about when we're ranking yes. the transformations, should we put in any weight into the fact that Nintendo officially values Patissier Peach statue potentially less than Sword Fighter Peach because it's only three missions to collect mm-hmm. versus uh, six missions for Sword Fighter Peach? Or should we think of this the reverse way where it's like, well, we think more people... right? would go for the patissier peach and so let's make that more readily available so more people will like yeah it's tough i mean i, I do in the event i do think that patissier and uh sword fighter are like the marquee transformations right um they were the two that were playable in the demo uh and they're both among the first four that you do in in, in the game so i uh i think we have to recognize that Nintendo values them uh, higher than the rest. Uh, but I, I don't know that we can discern too much about their relationship uh, in terms of value to Nintendo from this mission in Super Mario Run. I think. I, th- I think we don't have that right. information here. Yeah. Finally, mm-hmm. the 39th Tetris Maximus Cup is happening later this week. April 5th to April 8th, and it includes a special Princess Peach Showtime theme. This is very exciting. Obviously, uh, we, we had a moment where we were like, are we done with Tetris Maximus? Are these ever going to happen again? Uh, and sure enough, just as there was an event added to Mario Run, so too is there an event added to uh, Tetris Maximus in the name of Princess Peach Showtime. 
Uh, as with all Tetris Maximus Cups, you play Tetris 99 online to earn points. At 100 points, you can unlock the theme for use after the Maximus Cup event ends. Uh, and th all of these themes have also been available for uh, purchase using tickets uh, after the events have closed. Uh, but I, uh, I, I guess I'm not sure uh, how long it takes them to add them to, to the shop. Yeah, I'm not sure either. It doesn't take long to earn uh, 100 points. I haven't be been back to Tetris 99 in kind of a while, so I'm excited for the opportunity and the reason to uh, go back and, and earn this theme. Also cool to see them uh, supporting this game with uh, like events in two separate games, right? Yeah, like, totally. Uh, not that they're doing much else at this point, but it is nice to see them uh, supporting the game. All right, Mark, let's get out of the news. All right, that is going to do it for this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. Remember, uh, you should join our Discord if you're not already in there. Email us for an invitation. We will send one to you. Anthony DeLuca made our, uh, our logo. Our theme music is provided by Ape Betty. You can get more of his music by going to apebetty.com or by listening right now. For my co-host, Mark Mitchell, this is Patrick Eller saying thank you for listening.